Yeah, my name's Peter, Peter Pierce. And I came over to uh, this country, this province, this city, as a Beaverbrook Scholar in forestry in 1955. That's 55, 55 years ago. And uh, I'm still here <laughs> in town. <coughs> I've uh, had the honor and the pleasure of meeting the beaver two or three times and have some fairly vivid memories of those occasions, and I'd be quite happy to say a few words about it. Anyway, the first time was, um, I think it must have been in the fall of 1955, we had a, he, he threw a dinner for, for Beaverbrook scholars in the Lady Beaverbrook building, or the LB, it used to call it LBR, I think, in the refectory there. It seemed to be like a big crowd to me, and I remember that the, the wine seemed to flow pretty freely, which was kind of interesting because alcohol was a, was a no-no in residence there and indeed on campus. But this was a special occasion with a special man, so anyway. And I remember quite well singing a Greek folk song in Greek. <laughs> I don't know how I did it, and I couldn't do it today, but uh, one of my fellow scholars, his name was Roy Sutton, he accompanied me on the spoons. So it was just the spoons and me <laughs> doing this uh, Greek folk song, and the beavers sat back beaming, you know, that big, wide beam that he had, and uh, so he had a pretty good time. Um, going back to the alcohol business, uh, the matron at, uh, at the residence was Mrs. C Mrs. Christian, I think her name was, and she, she looked after us, but, and then there was uh, Alvin Shaw, who was a professor here, and uh, they made sure he towed the line, but on this particular occasion, that was thrown out the window. I feel sure that at uh, on that occasion, we must have sung the Jones Boys. Do you know about the Jones Boys? Well, the Jones Boys is a Miramichi folk song, one of the Beavers' favorites. And he made sure that when the, the residence was built, the, the chimes were programmed to play the Jones Boys at, at, uh, on the quarter hours, and I don't know whether they still do. But the story was that he would wander around campus, and uh, if the chimes started up, <laughs> he'd stop the nearest poor student going by, and, and together they'd listen to the Jones boys, and and he'd ask the student if if he knew um, what what the significant cost significance of all this was. He didn't know. Sorry. So I feel we sure we sang the Jones. Oh, the Jones boys say built a mill on the side of the hill. Ah, da, 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 I didn't make the gosh down sawmill pay. Anyway, we, I'm sure we sang that, so I had a very good time. Second occasion was when we had was another dinner. This is more intimate, more private, and this this was at Somerville House. Um, where we're meeting this afternoon. And there were just five of us there, I think, and so that would have been the three forestry scholars, it would be Roy Sutton, Keith Brown and myself, and two of the, they call them special scholars, and one was John Findlay, and he's going to be right here this afternoon, and Stephen Fain. So again, we <laughs> were getting along quite well, and... Uh, it was at the time of the Suez Crisis. This is long before your time, of course, but uh, what had happened was that um, the president of Egypt had all of a sudden uh, nationalized the Suez Canal and sent forces in to protect the canal for various reasons. I won't give you the history of all this, but anyway, and this must have been, this was in 1956, and it was in, uh, uh, must have been the early fall, because the the following crop of forestry scholars hadn't just had arrived by then. But anyway, so this was the big topic of conversation. This was a big crisis in the world that was looming, you know. So we asked the Beaver for his thoughts. He said, well, you know, that 
this is a this very very critical matter. He said, you know, this is a, this is a lifeline to the empire and the Commonwealth. He said, we well, have to protect this this um, this lifeline, whatever happens. And eventually, Britain and France invaded. But this was just before they just building up to that. So we said, well. What happens if, if we take military action there? What, what happens if, uh, say, the Russians step in or what, whoever it might be? He says, we have to protect this lifeline, he said, and we'll fight. And he said, we'll fight from Port Said in the Mediterranean. We'll fight right down to the Suez Canal. We'll fight on the water. We'll fight in the sand dunes. And, all this Churchillian ringing stuff, you know, to, to what he was saying. And then he stopped almost midstream. And he looked around and beamed, and there was this quiet, and he looked at each of us and he said, how did that sound? <laughs> <laughs> it was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. We all collapsed laughing, you know. It was right on. <laughs> As if to say, oh, you know, what do you expect? <laughs> so this was... Um, a kind of a window on his uh, on his sense of humour, I thought. And uh, the other thing I, I didn't want to mention, but uh, but I will, and because my wife said I should. And it must have been during the course of a conversation at one of these two dinners. He said, "You know, you look like Peter Townsend. Do you remember Peter Townsend? You know of him?" And this was just at the time when. The two of them, Peter Townsend and, and Princess Margaret, were quite romantically involved and it looked as though it was heading for marriage. But the Constitution that would have required her to renounce all rights to succession to the throne, I think to get out of the country for five years or whatever, if she married Peter Townsend because he was a divorced man and you know the constitution and the church and all that came into play and so it, it was just at the time when she made the decision in favor of staying in line and giving up her the love of her life <laughs> so, so Beaver says to me he says you better get over there he said you better get over there and try your luck with Princess Margaret <laughs> Well, needless to say, I didn't go and I'm still here. 